Welcome again to the first ever uh, hashtag Learning Saves Lives webinar. I am Dr. Gaya Gamheva Gay and I lead all capacity building and learning for WHO's Health Emergencies Program. It's a wonderful personal and professional pleasure to welcome you all. I can see we have hundreds on the call and, and the numbers are growing. And in the chat, I can see you're from all over the world. So thank you for those of you who are getting up early, staying up late, leaving your work to join this webinar. Um, let me just uh, propose how we move forward. I think it's important to say that this is a forum for us, an informal participatory forum for us to talk about things that we are passionate about. And one of the big things that we at the World Health Organization are passionate about is uh, social justice, equity in access for health. We are also very passionate that when you work in emergencies, we should be helping anyone, regardless of where they are, to access knowledge, life-saving knowledge, as it becomes available, especially during emergencies. I don't have to convince you of this during the pandemic. Everybody has seen how important this is. Now, why are we focusing on this topic today? Well, we are going into a weekend of international days. Tomorrow, uh, uh, Saturday, is the International Day of Social Justice. And in WHO, we understand this as equity for health. And we believe that equity in accessing health services can only be achieved when there's equity in access to learning, education, training for health. And Sunday is International Day of Mother Language. And this is where we want to showcase our commitment to getting knowledge to the front line using this powerful tool of language translation, not just into international languages, but into local languages. We will, um, I know thousands of you have registered and many of you will be looking at the recording of this. So I just wanna make sure that you know that we are recording everything you say here. The first part of this webinar will be about listening to our practitioners. And I have a great group of practitioners that I will introduce to you. The second part of our webinar is where our panelists who together will tell the story of how global knowledge reaches the front line and goes beyond. Uh, and the third part of our webinar is where we will listen to you, where you can ask your questions. To do that, please go to the Q&A. So any questions you want to ask the panel, you can write in the Q&A. Any comments you want to make, you can make in the chat. Is that okay? All questions in Q&A, then comments in chat, and we will get to your Q&A in the third part of our part of our uh, work. So I would like to, um, before we get to the, we get to the panel, as I said, let's warm up our conversation by talking to a group of practitioners. These are people who are passionate about learning, learning in emergencies, but most importantly, removing barriers to learning at the front line. Um, so here, here we go. I think our practitioners would also appreciate hearing from you what you think about some of the questions we've been grappling with. So Andrea, where are you? Andrea, if you could start a little poll for us, she'll put up the poll now. And I would like to hear, and the practitioners and the panelists would like to hear from you what you think of this. There are four questions, they're multiple choice. You will have to scroll down to see them all. I'm going to give you four minutes to answer this poll. So go ahead and, and dive in and answer the four questions that are here. You'll have to scroll down to see all of the questions. The time started about 10 seconds ago. I see you're slow to start up. Come on, let's vote.
That's great. I can see more and put more people coming on. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now we're into the hundreds. I can see there's a wide range of opinions that are emerging. Very good. What a wonderful uh, opportunity to hear from nearly 700 of you. What, what a wonderful opportunity. Half of you have voted. Thank you. Keep going. All right, we're coming up to three minutes. We are nearly 60% of you have voted. I'm going to give it just one more minute. These are really important questions. They're questions about the barriers that people face in accessing knowledge in emergencies. The importance to you personally of having material in your own language. And have you seen material in international, national or native language? So And I can see in the chat, you're from all over the world, Pakistan, Macedonia, uh, King Shasa, Democratic Republic of Congo, Nepal. Uh, I can't even keep up, Yemen, my goodness. <laughs> Canada must be early for you, Nigeria, lots of people from India, fantastic, Bangladesh. All right, I think, Andrea, we can end the polling. Yeah, about 70% have polled. And those of you who do surveys know 70% response rate is very good. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to take a minute to uh, share the results. Can we share the results, please? Yeah. Okay. So, we asked you, what is the biggest barrier for frontline health workers to access real-time learning? This has to be fast and relevant during health emergencies. And number one, surprise not, is time. Second, almost as frequent, is knowing where to get the knowledge. So even when the internet gives you all these options to find your way is difficult. Having knowledge in an official international language, um, so French, Russian, Spanish, Arabic, and so on, having knowledge in your own native language, one, one in five of you, no or poor internet access, one in three, and this is very much in line with global statistics, poor digital literacy, about a quarter of you. So we may have a device, but we don't know how to use it for learning. The cost of training for about a third of you, the cost of digital data, so although courses are free, you may have to pay for data and no support from your supervisor, okay? Second question, why is it important to have new knowledge in your own native language? Easier, deeper comprehension, and we have panelists who will, who will talk about this, 57% of you. Easier to use in practice, more than half of you. Easier to reach and show and teach others, 39. Easier to adapt to local context and culture, allowing you to share experience with others more than a third, allowing you to influence decision-making, and there were other reasons. 
Third question, how important is it to have new knowledge and training in your team's native language? Well, I'm glad those of you at the, in this webinar didn't say a waste of time. This is very good. 61% said it's essential and one, the rest said basically um, uh, it's important and 12% it said it's good, but not essential. Last question, how often have you seen COVID-19 knowledge or training in languages other than English? 41% of you have seen in several language versions. 45% of you have seen it maybe one or two, and 14% of you have only seen material in English. So uh, we will stop, uh, stop that window, Andrea. Thank you so much. I must say, I can't keep up with the chat. There are hundreds of messages in the chat. So I hope you, you are enjoying chatting to each other. That's very good. So uh, I just closed the window. Okay, great. So in, in just a matter of five minutes, we looked at <laughs> what is important to you, what is your experience and what are the barriers? So I'm really confident now we are in the right webinar talking about the right thing. Fantastic. So let's get started with our practitioners. So I have a range of really interesting practitioners, but this webinar couldn't start without somebody from my team, Haini Utunen, who really has been the powerhouse during the COVID-19 pandemic response to be fast, to be accurate, to have translated versions of life-saving knowledge uh, for COVID response that many of the other practitioners are using. So Haini, welcome and just talk to us about how this was achieved and why this was important for you. Thank you, Gaia. And really great to connect with the uh all of you uh, during these pandemic times when we are restricted physically, but we still can enjoy this, these moments of sharing online. It's really a great pleasure to be here today and, and uh, see you all. Um, it's really uh, one year and one month ago that our pandemic learning journey on OpenWHO started. And um, I put some results here on my backdrop uh, with uh, Next week, we are reaching 5 million learner enrollments. We have 7 million words translated all across 25 different COVID-19 topics and 55 other topics in, in health emergencies. So openwho.org has really been the, the central tool for us from WHO's uh, mandated areas, science and evidence-based materials uh, to be transferred to the world. And it feels to our team of 20 that we've been really working with the whole world. And here today, uh, many of the colleagues from, from the World Health Organization in the countries, in regions, but also from the par partner organizations um, who've been working with us over the past year have really made it a global pursuit and endeavor. It's been really uh, great that we've been able to, to build the learning um, that really crosses all the borders and barriers. And OpenWHO reaches really every corner of the world. It's low bandwidth adjusted, it's accessible in multi-devices and, and works uh, steadily and strongly thus reaching these results. And it's really a social justice that we feel the OpenWHO is bringing through the, the access, reach, but also the ease of uh, producing and publishing courses. Our first vaccine courses went live in December before most of the world were yet vaccinating. And, um, and, and we continue to produce this real-time learning that is then translated into all possible languages, thanks to you all and the big uh, communities of learners that also have volunteered and translated into so many languages. We are soon reaching 50 different languages on the platform. We are already uh, on 47 and counting. We have active pro productions for almost for 20 new languages. Uh, so the resources are there for everyone to join. And, and this brings the other th theme day of this week and the mother language day at the core of our work. So it is a value for us to provide um, learning in languages of the affected populations. And as we know, in the pandemic, this, it's all of us are uh, impacted in one way or the other. And we really want to, to make that, that reach 
in, in, in all languages, especially for, for the underserved languages. And I'm really grateful that today in the, in the sessions later, some colleagues from Translators Without Borders are talking, uh, colleagues from In What Language, who've been really ramping up the effort with us and, and making that effort to get the, 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 the most um, vulnerable language um, or, or the languages of most vulnerable populations available on, on our platform. We will have great evidence of, of this work. And um, beyond that, we've been um, working with WHO's country offices, many colleagues here will present uh, across the world. Um, we have more than 30 country offices and all, our, all of our six regional offices that have been working with us, as well as the Pan American Health Organization's virtual campus also present here today, uh, will, has, be, has been working on a very strong language production with us. And we take a pride of all this collaboration, volunteerism, and the crowdsourcing that, that uh, together with our technical experts, we've been able to identify and find uh, keen and interested professionals who have wanted to translate into so many languages. So, so this is really a, a start of a journey. It's been lasting for one year and we are happy despite all the negativities of the, the pandemic, but at least in this way we can stay connected and share the knowledge and learning together and thus save lives. Thank you, Haney. And you, you will see in the chat, there are lots of comments coming in about Open WHO. And I saw one comment about what, how can we translate into Swahili? We already have courses, I think, in 10 African languages, including Swahili. We'll talk about that. The point is, it isn't just something to do. Without people understanding essential knowledge in their own languages, we cannot stop this pandemic. We cannot bring it under control. So more than 10 uh, African languages, so, so Swahili is definitely there. Next, I'd like to move to one of the, uh, you know, the, the one of the things that Haney talked about. And we have a colleague from our WHO country office in Kazakhstan, uh, Dr. Vitalis uh, Stetsik. And uh, Vitali, I, I invite you just to share how you've taken some of this, you know, material on Open WHO, but you've broadened it up much, much more. The, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Kaya. Um, yeah, so here in Kazakhstan, on our daily basis, we are visiting healthcare facilities, laboratories, community centers, and we hear that there is uh, there is a need for knowledge, and uh, it, it is really an operationally challenging environment for us to, to meet this high demand for knowledge, whereas there is very limited time uh, for, for learners to dedicate because they are emergency responders. So what you've done here, we, we embrace the blended approach. So for our, uh, uh, our daily interaction with, uh, with healthcare workers, we've, we've uh, developed a very tailored and quite practical uh, uh, sessions uh, which have been delivered together with my colleagues from the regional office from Copenhagen on original uh, on uh, case management on infection prevention control. So uh, during those thematic sessions, we've been uh, we've been we've been using this opportunity to expand understanding and awareness of Open WHO Plus. In addition, we topped it up uh, with uh, with in, in incorporating the, the the Open WHO materials and the, the, the courses which are available into the training uh, curriculum uh, of the medical universities here in the country. So working with the academia has been really a pivotal step for us to, to make sure that this, law, uh, this knowledge law, uh, is reaching the frontline respond, uh, responders because also the academia in Kazakhstan is very strong and very highly, highly regarded and very, uh, very much referenced by, by frontline uh, workers. Also, we've, we've gone into the partnership uh, with, uh, uh, with professional associations uh, of uh, primary health care, critical care physician, ID physicians, and et cetera, who are also further, uh, further spreading uh, the advocacy and spreading the, the information about the, uh, the, the courses as uh, already uh, has been reflected by our dear participants that it is difficult sometimes to understand where to get the information from. So that's a good also channel for us was to spread the understanding about the courses. And also we are currently working in bringing the knowledge closer and the bringing evidence closer to uh, frontline responders who translating the most popular courses in Kazakhstan into the Kazakh language. So it's also a, a, a huge step in which we collaborate also with the National Professional Association of Medical Universities who are supporting also 
and, and, and volunteering and supporting um, uh, translating those materials and making them ready for, uh, for, uh, for each and every frontline um, uh, responder. So um, yeah, I think it's in the nutshell uh, that the approach is to endorse and I'm happy to elaborate and answer the question. Th thank you, Vitaly. This really speaks to the sort of the, the ecosystem that we need, right? So at global level, we have the guidance, WHO is developing guidance. It's our job to very quickly get it into online packages, make sure adult learning is there. But in clinical practice, you really need those multipliers and adapters, not just Absolutely. language, not the uh, language, but uh, to help people learn the practice and gain the competencies. So you see, it really really is we are part of an ecosystem. It's not uh, just us. I, but of course, I'm very heartened to see uh, the comments here. Somebody called the learnings magical. And, and I really think uh, it's, it's really um, important to see this is a social endeavor, right? It, it's not a production line. It's not a commodity. It's a public good. And we all have a part to play. Thank you so much, uh, Vitaly. Let's go to our Tajikistan country office. Dr. Safarov, uh, you have your story, a similar but also unique story. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. The dear colleagues, uh, let me briefly uh, share with you the Tajikistan experience on the implementation of the WHO Open uh, Learning Courses. Uh, from the beginning, uh, professionally, uh, I started to uh, start from myself to learn uh, and to transfer the knowledge to my colleagues in the Ministry of Health and the social protection of the population and the other national counterparts and our international donors and partners. Uh, during the last year, we saw that uh, this platform it, uh, within uh, rational language, it was very, very useful and the people for save the time and also uh, um, uh, duration and also the materials, it was very useful from the short period they started to learn. And uh, the, due to this reason, uh, we start uh, to discuss with the government of the Tajikistan to implement in order to uh, implement the sustainability of the learning platform to save their lives during not only pandemic, but also uh, others uh, outbreaks and uh, to be well prepared in the future. And the country started to implement in the curriculum uh, in the two main medical university in the country, one in the regional one and another one in the national level. And we see how uh, the students and also the main uh, future, our doctors, uh, start to uh, very interest uh, on the implementation or also to uh, improve the knowledge in the short period with very uh, 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 demonstration or interactive or uh, illustration materials in order to improve their knowledge for the future uh, safe lives in the country level and the contribution in the regional and then globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Safarov, uh, very, very interesting. And also sort of indicating that emergencies and what we do in emergencies, this innovation can have a much larger impact. Uh, to change a curriculum in medical school is a multi-year effort, but, but see how quickly you know, we can work together and become fit for purpose. It's, it's really quite a, you know inspiring story and we are forever changed. You know, we at the beginning of the pandemic, we talked about going back to normal, but now we have a new normal, right? And the new normal must include learning in uh, learning and, and revolutions to the way we are learning. So now I'd like to cross the Atlantic <laughs> and move all the way <laughs> to the Americas. And we have uh, Lea Marie Richards from uh, WHO's team in Suriname. Tell us uh, what has been your experience? How have you been uh, participating in this? Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. So to start off, I just want to share with you a little bit of where Suriname is and how, how it matters in terms of their geography. So Suriname is a relatively small country, 600,000 people, and they gained their independence from the Kingdom of the Netherlands in, only in 1975. But of course, because of this long historical connection with the Netherlands, Suriname maintains Dutch as its official language for administration and educational purposes. The other thing to note is that Suriname is in continental South America and it shares a border with Guyana on the west, French Guyana to the east and Brazil to the south. 
each with its own language. So the borders of Suriname, like other countries in South America, they struggle to maintain and fully man their borders. So of course, there's continuous movement of persons across these borders, with language being um, one, of the, one of the things that moves with these people. The additional factor is that Suriname is a member of the Caribbean community. Uh, this is a mix of Caribbean islands and small states, and they speak predominantly English. So with all of that uh, and the emergence of the pandemic, we at the PAHO office struggled to get healthcare workers on the front line to keep up with new and emerging technical knowledge that was being distributed by our head office, uh, PAHO WHO, as well as at the global level. Then came the Open WHO platform on COVID-19. And truly it was magical because when I saw these courses and how frequently they were coming out, I just inquired with the team whether it was possible to have them translated. And of course they said yes, and we were extremely happy. So under normal circumstances in a non-pandemic time, Suriname healthcare workers would have the time to take these courses and follow them in English. But during COVID pandemic, the COVID pandemic, we had to be practical. It is much faster and easier for anyone to understand technical knowledge when it is in one's mother tongue, especially in a pandemic. So we recognize, we recognize this and to date, we have translated five courses from the Open WHO platform into Dutch and the uptake has been wonderful. In fact, the Suriname Nursing School has included the Open WHO course on infection prevention and control as a mandatory course for all students prior to being deployed to assist with the COVID-19 response. We have four additional courses currently being translated and the Ministry of Health has been highly appreciative of this support. I actually received the Dutch translated text for the vaccine deployment course this morning and how timely, because the country is due to receive the bulk of its vaccines in coming weeks. So we will have this course translated and launched so that healthcare providers can benefit and be prepared. Thanks. Thank you, Leah, absolutely. And, and the whole, if you look at our global strategy for pandemic, we have three objectives, right? Of course, it's to reduce, stop the transmission, but it's also to protect the vulnerable and save lives. And, you know, 600,000 people are not big on the global scale, but, but how important that we are able to make that link and you're able to do that. And another point in your intervention is you made a learning mandatory before something was done so that we could maintain quality and actually save lives without unnecessarily endangering the lives of health workers. This is also very, very important. You know, in the beginning of the pandemic, health workers constituted 3% of the world's population, but they constituted 16, 20% of the, the, the cases and deaths. So, you know, all, all of these complex things uh, can, can be supported by a unified effort for learning. Absolutely. And since we're in the Americas, it's my absolute pleasure to call on a friend, Gabriel uh, Litovsky from the PAHO virtual campus. And right at the beginning, Haney and Gabriel worked together and they decided, let's join hands and let us work together. So Gabriel posted uh, Open WHO content on PAHO virtual campus. He translated it into Spanish. And in fact, Spanish is the second most used language on the platform. Gabriel, over to you. Thanks, Gaia. It's a pleasure to, to participate today and to, to share some, some comments. <clears throat> uh, first of all, congrats about this session and excellent to, to this different experience in different regions with uh, different requirements. It's very interesting to see the data of the today uh, survey because it's it's, it's good feedback to, 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 our, to our work. Uh, um, I want to share with all the participants that the PAHO Virtual Campus have 15 years of story to work in virtual learning strategies, but during the, the pandemic, the PAHO Virtual Campus reached more than 2 million enrollments in courses and became a key tool to support technical cooperation with the countries in, in, in our region in, in America. It's clear that to learn and to learn together and to discuss together, it's, it's key 
in the in the context of the of the our health system. Uh, Gaia, I, Gaia and thanks, uh, uh, Heini. I want to, to emphasize that one of the best work done was the articulation that we achieved with Open Who in the first days of the, of the pandemic to discuss about the cars, to translate and to adapt, adapt the cars to our region was very important and very, very useful. And to adapt not only the language, the culture, the reality, the necessities of region is very important. Finally, uh, transform health systems, uh, promote access, respond to emergencies like this pandemic. Uh, uh, I suppose call to be able to support health workers with the spaces to, to dialogue, to exchange, to learn and will together. Thank you very much uh, to to, to this work and we need to, to continue to work together with this idea. Thank you very much to Open Who to open doors to work together and to build together uh, the courses that each region needs. Thank you very much and let's keep working together over Gaia. Thank you so much. So, so I hope participants, panelists, practitioners, everybody can see how diverse you know, our efforts are, but how they come together and they're unified for absolutely saving lives and how language is an absolutely transformational tool in order to reach people, not just to give them information, but really help comprehension, particularly when they're under pressure, when they are fearful for their lives and the lives of people they're helping and their families. And of course, this is no easy, uh, no easy task. Uh, because uh, if many of you are professional translators here, you will see that quality control, you know, uh, liability, have we got this right? These are all uh, uh, very challenging things. But the, but the thing is, in an emergency, to balance all of these things. How do we balance all of these things? And of course, WHO at global level has a role, but it is the beginning of a journey. It's not the end of the journey. And many of the speakers, the practitioners today, have, uh, have contributed to taking that further, adapting it. As Gabriel said, it's not just translation into Spanish, but translation into context, into culture. And we're gonna hear about this uh, very soon. Uh, so we're, gonna, we're, we're ready to almost start the panel. Uh, but before that, I see there are lots of questions in the, in the q and I'd really like you to focus your questions on learning training education during emergencies and how it relates to languages. There are lots of questions about COVID vaccine and so on. I have to tell you, I am a doctor, but I am not, uh, I do not have the latest information on that. And this is not the panel for that, but we will co collect all your questions and we will feed it to the team. So as they do press briefings and so on, they address some of those questions. So I apologize to you if you asked a question that we're not going to answer. But here we are. So we are ready to start the panel. I see Dr. Mike Ryan, the Executive Director of Emergency Preparedness and Response has uh, just joined. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for coming. And um, we've, we've got lots of people. Uh, uh, and the warm up act before the panel was actually, we listened to um, uh, six uh, practitioners, but you get to listen to the last practitioner before we start the panel. Dr. Priyanka Relan, uh, thank you so much. You, you are part of the WHO team, health systems, clinical management at global level. I want you to segue from our practitioners into the panel by sharing your recent experience uh, in education and learning for the COVID response. Uh, you have a couple of minutes, Priyanka. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaia, um, and bonjour à tous. Uh, hello, hola, galafanagan uh, to my Somali colleagues, Somali and Somaliland colleagues. <laughs> it's um, it's truly such an amazing um, event here to see so many of you on the line um, and to connect with all of you through this virtual platform and to connect with all of you all over the world. Um, so many different countries and languages that we are reaching just through this webinar um, really speaks to how, how we've been able to connect all together over this last year. 
Um, so as Dr. Gaia said, um, I work here at, at headquarters on the clinical management team, um, both in health systems as well as part of the COVID-19 response. And um, it's been an incredible journey over this last year in seeing how much the learning has transformed um, the way that we connect with colleagues around the organization and throughout the world. Through OpenWHO, through our other learning platforms, um, we've really seen how courses and trainings have been able to save lives for the doctors and the nurses and the, and the clinicians and the rest of the healthcare staff at the front line. Um, and you're know, truly this hashtag learning saves lives. It's a way that we see that we can serve the vulnerable and we can protect healthcare workers. We protect them with PPE. We talk about that all the time, but we can also protect them with knowledge, arm them with this knowledge in order to be able to save, save lives of patients all around the world. And um, you know, through the health systems work um, for the last several years, our team in, especially in around emergency care, where I'm an emergency medicine doctor and I have been working with emergency care systems for quite some time. And we've developed courses and trainings. Um, we've, you know, over the years worked on translating a lot of them, but to be able to do that now, you know, in, in the COVID era, emergency doctors, emergency clinicians, frontline providers and primary care, critical care, all of the healthcare staff has never been more so in the spotlight than it is now in the COVID pandemic. And we've really been able to see how much that speed of being able to reach the frontline workers is so crucial at this time. And so through OpenWHO and through our colleagues, we've been able to not only get this knowledge out there on the, on the website and open access, very rapidly, but also keep it up to date with the most up to date guidance. And you know, with COVID, we're learning so much uh, day by day, hour by hour, really, and we've been able to rapidly develop the guidelines and then rapidly transform that into learning. So that those of you who have already spoken, you've 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 said, you've been able to get the trainings before you even get the vaccines. <laughs> and that's that's incredible. That's absolutely what where we should be. We should be armed with the knowledge to be able to implement the, the guidance, the tools at the front line at the same time, as, as soon as we receive them and be ready to receive them fully. And so um, over this last little while, uh, for the last couple of months, I spent uh, quite some time in Somalia and Somaliland, not only taking this uh, online courses and delivering them to the colleagues on the ground, the frontline health workers, but really uh, doing a hybrid approach as one of our other colleagues sp spoke about and um, transforming the, and seeing it live, seeing how these courses transform into local context. You know, we, we don't have this, some of our clinical courses translated into Somali yet, but we were able to um, bring the healthcare workers together, uh, teach them uh, in English, very slowly, very, very, um, very method methodically, and, and see them translate the course into Somali in real time and show each other, teach each other in real time, uh, the practical skills that go along with uh, emergency doctors and critical care doctors um, at the front line. And that was, um, that was an incredible experience seeing how, how it, what it takes for this comprehension to take place. Mm -hmm not only about teaching them in English, but then making sure that they understand it and they can teach others. So we did a training as well as training of trainers and um, helping them understand what adult learning is like, how to teach, how not to teach, um, how to set up all the different parts of the course and, and really ensure that comprehension happens at, at, at the district level. And so it was, uh, it was quite an amazing experience and I'm really honored to be able to, to see so many of my colleagues here today on the line from, from that uh, training. Um, and I look forward to, to answering some more questions and, and seeing how uh, the experience of the frontline doctors uh, really shapes up um, in, the, in the months and years to come. Thank you so much, Frank. And what, what a great uh, segue to uh, the panel. So just for Mike's information, we had a series of practitioners from countries and regions who talked about, you know, how they've used open WHO language training and how they have multiplied that in their country using blended learning. And um, uh, Priyanka took us to uh, uh, Somalia and Somaliland. And so the panel discussion really is the story of what happened and how we 
uh, were able to help in some small way to translate some of the core knowledge into the local language. And to start that story is, uh, is uh, somebody um, who's been supporting us and working with us for some time, uh, Sheldon Wardwell. Sheldon will introduce himself very briefly because he's the first piece in the story, followed by, he'll be followed by Dr. Mona, who is a central character of this story, followed by Ellie Kemp, who is really one of these multipliers, champions, enablers, and then Mike, it will be you. So uh, you have an opportunity to listen to them as well. So we will keep it quite brief uh, because I know uh, Dr. Ryan's agenda is very tight. And after he leaves, we can continue to have the discussion. Sheldon, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Gaia for putting on this event. And thank you, doc Dr. Ryan for joining us. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Gaia about five years now ago at the CDAC conference in Thailand. And I knew quickly she was the person that I needed to get to know in order to uh, magnify or multiply an impact around the, the globe. And at that time, I was working with a translation and technology company. And not to the same level as Translators Without Borders, but we were donating some translation services. For the past 10 years, I've had the opportunity to work on humanitarian and development initiatives around the, uh, around the world in some pretty challenging areas from the, the Altiplano or highlands of Bolivia uh, to the floodplains of the Nile. Um, during the height of the civil war in South Sudan, I was a protection officer. And throughout these experiences, uh, one of the, the key lessons I learned was the importance and the need to break not only language barriers, uh, but cultural barriers as well. And so I would, I would push this group to think about not only the need to translate material, but to think about how it's delivered and the need to, to establish uh, trust. Um, before I get started on this story in Somalia, I'll just make one other comment. Dr. Gaia, she invited me to participate in a, in a, in a conference in, in the UK, um, which involves anthropologists and linguists about the Ebola uh, outbreak. And what was most shocking to me was, even though everyone in the room spoke English, it seemed like the anthropologists and the health professionals weren't speaking the same language. I know Dr. Gaia is pushing me to be quick though. So uh, let me tell you about I, Sinag. I know the story, Sheldon, go ahead. <laughs> Sinag is a, a northeastern region of Somaliland. It's one of the most uh, undeveloped regions, I think it's, it's safe to say, um, in the world. It has some of the most, uh, the, the worst maternal and child health uh, or mortality rates on the planet. For the last three years, I've been working with the Healing Hands Foundation um, to establish a hospital. Um, many communities in this uh, region, which, which, uh, which has a catchment population of 600,000 to a million, don't, do not have access to basic child and maternal health care. Um, with our local partners, the Jabril Foundation and ResponseMed, we've established the basic infrastructure. We've built a 37 bed inpatient facility with outpatient diagnostics, a and &E, an operating theater, et cetera. Um, we have recruited one of the best teams of local Somali doctors, including Dr. Mona, who will pass it on, on to next. And um, as the pandemic broke out and, and our project was delayed from opening, I, I knew from working with Dr. Gaia, the importance of the material that, that she was providing. So I had asked that our doctors each go through all of the, the courses available in OpenHO. And the feedback that I received from the doctors, we recruited three doctors from the number one medical program in Somaliland. And all three said that the material in those programs were not only good refresher courses, uh, but that they also provided a lot of new material. And more importantly, they said that the only native speakers throughout the region 
were not aware of a majority of the information provided in those courses. And so I'll, I'll leave questions for the panel discussion, but I just wanna say, um, I'm really proud to be a part of the this project uh, from the doTERRA Healing Hands project. We have established the infrastructure necessary to even bring together a group and provide them Wi-Fi access. Um, and then we've recruited local doctors like Dr. Mona and our other doctors, Hawa and Dr. Muhammad, and that it requires this broader network, not just translated, not just simply translated material, but we need to build a network of the infrastructure and the human network um, of trained care providers and community champions if we're re really going to save lives and reduce maternal and child mortality rates and um, uh, stop the pandemic like the current one and future ones. Thank you, Shelton. Uh, I, I know we could really talk for a long time, but we'll stop there. Uh, and it's a great segue because actually uh, after Sheldon contacted us, Haney's group was able to develop uh, uh, together with In One Language, who again donated free translation services, the COVID-19 intro course, the infection prevention control course, the PPE, personal protection equipment course, and hand hygiene course into Somali. And the person, one of the people who's using it uh, is Dr. Mona uh, Jamal. Uh, so Dr. Mona, it's, it's wonderful to have you here. If you could very briefly just tell us what you did with this and what you or what this means to you. Over to you. Uh, Hannah, thank you very much, Dr. Gaia. And thank you for having me here today in this webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this today. Uh, I'm, uh, as my name already mentioned, uh, Dr. Mona, a family medicine physician or specialist from Somaliland. Uh, I've been working in this remote area for the last three years and in Senac region, Irigabo, where I've been treating as well as teaching and upgrading health quality among health workers. It was last year, yeah, when uh, me and some of my colleagues, as the Sheldon had mentioned, Dr. Hawa and Dr. Mohammed, did the online WHO courses. And at that point, it was very interesting, refreshing, and also very informative, learning more about the, uh, the disease of COVID-19. Um, and then by that time, it was, uh, the feedback was questioned that uh, how, uh, is it worth it for the health workers to get, uh, or would it benefit the health workers to understand and, de and do these courses online? And the answer was yes, when Sheldon uh, have considered this and put it into an action and uh, now, Fortunately, we have a Somali version of the online courses where health workers can easily have access to it and also participate the courses online. Uh, it was not that far when myself presented uh, to my uh, to the discourses to my colleagues in Somali language, where I was showing them that this course is available and that they can attend, and that they will get some new new learning um, points uh, from COVID nineteen as part of uh, you know spreading uh, the the information. So. Um, as well as uh, how to pre to prevent uh, uh, or the ways to prevent it, the transmission, and more importantly, protecting ourselves as frontliners. Yeah. Uh, I believe this was a great message, and as I. Um, I informed my colleagues, they were willing uh, to spread it and to use it as a tool in, in Somali, which will also in, uh, increase the learners of how to uh, deal with COVID-19. So um, we learn and I'm willing to learn and also increase uh, this, um, the capacity of other people uh, to uh, be part of learning this uh, COVID-19 in Somali, which is available for them all the time. Uh, thank okay. you. Thank you, Dr. Mona. And we're hearing time and time again how all of you are taking the languages, even the national and local languages, but you're multiplying it by using other uh, teaching learning techniques. And Dr. Mona, you're providing life-saving services, you're learning and you're teaching others. And, and in our previous conversation, you told me, 
your health facility is where the community actually comes to get health knowledge, not just health services. So thank you so, so much uh, for, for sharing that. Um, before we move on to Mike, Ellie uh, Kemp from Translators Without Borders. In fact, uh, Translators Without Borders were our first partners and, and really held our hand as WHO moved into languages that were beyond the UN languages. And, and really, I will re forever remain grateful for the guidance and the participation and, and the collegiality that Translators Without Borders has shown us and where we joined your fight to get things to people in languages that matter to them. So Ellie, a, a few, a couple of minutes and uh, then we will move on to Mike. Thank you. Certainly, thank you so much. And it's, it's lovely to be here with all these professionals and practitioners and, and to hear these stories. And it's been a great honor to work with WHO on, on helping to make learning available in, in a wide range of language. I wanted to, to pull the camera back a little bit and look at why TWB, Translators Without Borders, works on that and, and why that is our fight. Um, and in between um, Social Justice Day and uh, Mother Tongue Day, it's appropriate to say that it's about language justice. Um, because, of course, accessing learning, accessing information in your own language and also making yourself understood, uh, making yourself heard, they're fundamental rights, but we, they depend on language for, for mutual understanding, which is obvious. And yet it's something that we very commonly overlook in emergencies, both public health emergencies and humanitarian emergencies, although that is the time when communication can, of course, be the difference between life and death. Typically in humanitarian and public health responses, we're not routinely collecting information from people on their language and communication preferences. Um, and instead we routinely rely on community workers like community health workers um, to know which languages everybody speaks and understands and is comfortable in and to relay information and manage questions in those languages. That's, that creates an unfair additional burden on some very hardworking people who already have a tough enough job as it is. Um, and it can, of course, fuel confusion and misinformation. And it's equally obvious that if we plan, if we don't plan health services and other humanitarian and, um, and development services with attention to language, then there's a risk that speakers of marginalized languages, not the big, the national, the international, the dominant languages, but more marginalized languages, they risk not being able to communicate with the medics. They risk not being able to understand the information on the medicine that they're given. Um, and because we typically don't track health outcomes either by the patient's first language, we have no information on how big a problem that is, how many people are affected, or indeed what the knock-on effects for public health might be. But what we do know from TWB's research and from the work of other organizations is that the people who typically struggle to, um, to speak and to read and to understand in dominant national, international languages are also those who typically get less chance at an education. And so you'll see wherever we go that women and girls and older people and people living with disabilities are disproportionately represented among those who have difficulty accessing learning, accessing information and making their voices heard. The good news, and I think we've heard some of it, some of the examples of it in the, the representation so far already, is that some of the answers, some of the solutions to those problems are almost equally obvious. Um, and we've seen the most amazing uh, spontaneous galvanizing of the superpower of language over the course of the, the COVID-19 pandemic with thousands and thousands of translators and linguists and um, coming forward to share knowledge by putting their own language skills um, into play. Uh, we can also much more routinely and we must gather information, ask people about their language and communication preferences and use that as a basis to plan communication for and with them. Um, and the other thing that we can do and that TWB is working on um, is to harness the power of language technology. Um, although access to technology is still way too unequal, the world is digitizing um, and we can harness that potential in order to, to upend the current language power dynamic, which says that I as a native English speaker can make myself heard anywhere, can access whatever information I like. Um, if we can put language technology in the hands of speakers of marginalized languages, and we can, um, then they can control their own communication, their own access to information. And that has to be the way forward. 
Thank, Thank you, you so much, Elliot. And, and, and really, it's important to, to step back and see the broader picture. And, and it's really encouraging to see how you are really empowering people to have the tools to to uh, so so it is a power power uh, dynamic that we are trying to address thank you very much mike are you are you ready it, it's really a very busy schedule for dr ryan and uh, it's it's a wonder that he was able to find the time there he is mike the floor is yours yes thank you uh gaia um Yes, it's been crazy, but this is actually, I was just very nice just listening to the last uh, three interventions. I was actually sitting back here and, and just enjoying the stories. And uh, I think that's uh, something we should do more for each other is tell each other stories uh, in our own languages. Uh, sometimes I found even listening to languages that I don't understand, you can, you can get so much information from them just by the way in which the language is expressed. So language is hugely important to uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's so much part of our being and it's so much part of our identity uh, that uh, it forms more than just words. Uh, so it's great that on the day of uh, international mother tongues and uh, in Ireland, our mother tongue is supposed to be, to be, uh, to be Irish and uh, we struggle to maintain uh, our cherished language all the time against uh, the forces of globalization and sameness isn't it terrible? The world is becoming so so the same, and our diversity is what's under pressure. Be it our cultural, our biodiversity, we're trying to make everything the same. It's uh, it's uh, it's very sad, but it's very encouraging to hear people come together around this theme today, uh, learning language um, uh, and all of these things. So it's a real pleasure for me, in fact, and. In that sense, uh, Guy, it's a break for me from the monotony of the rubbish I get up to all the time. Um, so thanks to Sheldon and to Mona and to Eddie and, uh, and yourself, Guy, and the whole team for, for all you do. For lifting us up when we need to be lifted. Uh, I think it's big weekends. Uh, we've got Social Justice, International Day of Social Justice, and the Mother Tongue's Day, I think, one after the other, or they're the same day. I think they, you manage to coordinate them on different days at least. Um, and uh, and I think in that sense the two are collide in a way when you spoke about reaching everybody you know we reach every person we reach every health worker nobody gets left behind is that not the essence of social justice you know, that everyone has equal access equal rights and not everyone gets the same thing at the same time there's always a line and sometimes we find ourselves at the front or the back of the line but your race or your ethnicity, the amount of money you have should not determine where you stand in the line. So there will always be a line. There will always be an element of rationing and there will always be precious resources to distribute, be they the resource of education or the resource of a vaccine. The question is not, will we have limited resources? We always do. That is the world we live in, unfortunately. The question is how we decide who gets access to those resources and who gets to decide. Uh, and that's what I have a problem with, <laughs> is ensuring that society decides, not vested interests, uh, and that we try, and we try, although we will fail, to look at every one of these things we have as a pressure, uh, precious resource. And in that sense, now everyone's talking about equitable access to vaccines, and it's great, and it's fun fantastic to be having that conversation. It's tragic to have to have it, but it's fantastic that it's happening, not now at least, and not 10 years from now. Uh, but also, uh, we need equitable, equitable access to life-saving knowledge. Because right now, in this pandemic, and up to now, it's our knowledge that's actually been the most important countermeasure. Knowledge has been the power that saved lives up to now. And I think you've got that team you keep hammering me with, uh, Gaia. Learning saves lives. I, I, it's almost like a ticker tape in my dreams at this point. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it, it's meaningful because for two reasons it's meaningful. Because number one, it has the, the, the distinct advantage of actually being true. Uh, uh, but it also focuses on what we're trying to do here, the outcome we're trying to get. Learning is not, learning in itself is great. My granddad always told me there's nothing you'll ever learn that won't be useful to you. You know, that, that learning is a great thing in its own right. 
but learning that is directed at actually an outcome that we all want to see, which is saving lives and being able to shape that learning to do just that is something I really commend you all for doing. And I, I know there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of people on this call. I don't know how, how many you, know, you manage to rustle up, but you're, 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 you lot are very good at pulling the crowd together. You, you're in the wrong world. You should have been in, in entertainment or in, you know, sort of maybe <laughs> event management, uh, but, uh, you know, we're all sort of gathered around this virtual um, uh, fireplace today talking about that issue of learning and, and how much uh, of a right that is. I mean, I come from a working class background. I come from a, a background where I lost my dad early. My mum dragged us up. My education came because the state decided it would pay for my education. My, my you know, uh, you know, we were given the social supports needed uh, to survive and not become the delinquent that I was destined to become without those social supports. Um, so uh, we all emerge in our adult life as a product of learning. Um, and let's think about all those kids around the world who've lost that opportunity over the last year and a half and the impacts that that is having on their lives. The, co the cost of this pandemic is not just measured in gravestones. Uh, it's going to be measured in, in the, the, really the reverberating social and economic aspects of that. The question is whether we recognize in that process that we can build a better society that uh, can do this better in future, but also be fair um, and understand that the fragilities that this pandemic has exposed uh, the injustice is exposed. I keep saying uh, that in some ways the pandemic has ripped away the bandages from a very old wound in our society, and that is the wound of injustice uh, and the wound of lack of access to, to everything. Uh, so it's uncovered uh, and revealed rather than itself caused all the problem. Uh, and we know that in our own family lives. You know, when you've... when. You, when you're in a, in, a, in a desperate situation in any social or any personal relationship, uh, you know, never go to an Irish wedding or an Irish funeral because it's, it's the tip of the iceberg for all of the underlying issues that get, get, uh, get highlighted. Um, you know, that uh, some, for some people, the saddest time of the year is Christmas time or it's a time of celebration because that's when all of the, the difficulties in your life or your loneliness or whatever is revealed. And I think, we need to look at some events like this pandemic as revealers. And they've actually revealed that we're very dysfunctional. And there are fundamental issues at play here, not just the pandemic. Uh, and if we don't begin to address them, then we don't use this terribly tragic opportunity to evolve and become a better society. So in that sense, I think, and I'm, you know, I'm riffing now on the more philosophical guy, but I think it speaks to the heart of why learning is so important and why giving access to everyone to learn is so important and why mother tongue and language is so important and how much more. I see it here uh, all the time with our staff who, who all speak English, most of them as a second language. And the most exciting thing I hear sometimes is when they get a chance to speak in their own language and there's a different person speaking. The confidence that comes through, that ability to express yourself without thinking, is this an and or a but or a we or a they? You know, the, the constraint that comes with having to communicate in the second and sometimes third language. I don't know, Dr. Money, you're probably in your third or your fourth language in English at this stage. Uh, so I think that's for me is just showing how much easier it is to express oneself in one's mother tongue, how much more easy it is to learn in that tongue and to trans and to absorb that knowledge. So, you know, kudos and thanks to all of you out there in be it you in the UN system and the NGO system and the in the, in 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 in, in, our, in the private sector who've been working, doing everything to amplify and translate and get that learning in a form that everyone can access. I think it's a massive uh, achievement, um, and the fact that millions of people are now included in COVID nineteen learning that would not have otherwise been is something you should all take a bow for, you know. Uh, so will you all. Walk up to the mirror, morning or evening, you know, the next time you do it, just look at the mirror and say, you know what, congratulate yourself. You've been part of something very special. 
uh, and something that we should uh, continue. Um, the um, uh, you know the access issue, and I, I won't labour it, but you know it's 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 not just about vaccines. It's about soap and water. It's about basic access to education. It's about access to a safe place. Uh, the, the 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 amount of violence that's entering our world and 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 in COVID nineteen. So you know access to what? What are the things that are most important in your life that protect you and advance your existence? And we know all around the world. Uh, the, the vaccine issue is just purely highlighting uh, that the growing vaccine nationalism we've seen uh, and all of those things. And, we, and I would just love to see every citizen stand up now and actually say to their governments, we need to share. This is just too important. We need to share. Uh, and uh, whether that's sharing of knowledge or sharing of vaccines, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll solve each of these problems as we go along. The, I think the other just practical thing, and you know this uh, guy on team better than me, there are a lot of practical barriers to learning. Um, first of all, you know, one's own individual mindset. Uh, I know a lot of people who think that they know everything uh, already. So the mindset of constant learning in life, the mindset that you never know enough, in fact, that you always have to evolve. Uh, it's easy to convince a 16 or 17 year old that they need to learn. The hardest part, as you know, guy in our office, is convincing the 45 year olds that they need to learn, right? Uh, so learning is a lifelong experience uh, and learning is something that should be constant. Uh, and that in itself, the mindset to learn uh, is a barrier to learning, unless we have that mindset. Uh, obviously there are major cost barriers for people and uh, there are barriers Related to that cost, but, you know, simply not having data on your phone, simply not having access to a computer, simply not having access to the internet. Um, uh, gender is a, is a massive barrier to access uh, in terms of learning. 80% of our frontline health workers on this planet are women. The health service in the world is not delivered by men. It's primarily, if actually, you took the men out of the health service, the health service would do just fine. You took the women out of the health service in the world, it would collapse around its own ears. And yet they're the most underpaid, under-recognized. There are more glass ceilings in the health service <laughs> than, than there are uh, anywhere else in the world. So uh, if we really are going to address the barriers to learning, we have to address the gender gap and the way in which that is dealt with. Um, we also, I think, need to recognize that People have different ways of learning uh, and we have to adapt to people's learning styles and it can't be a one size fit all. I know I learn in a certain way. Uh, basically, I only learn something when I absolutely have to and then I'm actually really good at learning, right? But I have to have an incentive. Right? Generally, I tend to be motivated towards learning if I give myself a goal and I say, look, I'm going to make that presentation in a week because the only way I'm going to learn this stuff is if I give myself that goal. For some people, that's too much stress. They like to learn in a much more structured way. Some people like to dip in and dip out. Some people like to squeeze their learning into a period of time that they can lay out. We have to make learning more focused on the user's need and the user's time and the user's preference, not on the preference of the deliverer, of the teacher, or of the institution. Uh, because that's the way I think younger people particularly are consuming the world and media right now. They're consuming it a la carte. Uh, and, and the constraints that we place on learning, I think, are way too formalistic uh, at the moment. Um, uh, and then, obviously, the last one, coming back to finish off, to end the theme, unless we deliver our products and transfer knowledge, develop learning platforms that address the language issues, again, going back to what the, the, the native tongue and mother tongue learning, um, then obviously that in itself is is a massive is a massive massive barrier. So um, you know, uh, learning is a is a great it's a fellow traveler in life. What you learn is a, is almost like an armor for life. It gets you through so much in terms of knowledge, and having knowledge gives you confidence, and confidence gives you the 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 ability to contribute and do it with confidence. Uh, uh, you know, it's amazing how vulnerable one feels if you don't feel that you have the knowledge to be in the situation you're in. And it's amazing how some people in those situations make people feel very vulnerable by uh, 
letting them know how much they don't know. You know, if, if you ever go into a meeting and everyone starts telling you all their qualifications and then where they got them from <laughs> and then how many honors they got. And by the time everything is finished, you feel very, very small. Uh, so language or learning and the achievement of it actually can end up becoming in itself a prejudice. Uh, uh, because we don't have ways of certifying the learning that goes on through life and, 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 and certifying the learning that goes on through experience. Uh, we have this in WHO, uh, Guy, you know this, we have all of these requirements to get into different levels of the system. There can be someone who's a logistician who's worked in the field for 25 years and they, you know, they're the MacGyver of the world. They can build a refugee camp out of four, four boxes of matches Yet you can't promote them because the system says they have to have a PhD or the system says they have to have a master's. Uh, and I think we have to find better ways of, uh, I, I don't know, documenting the learning process in life that's more informal and then recognizing that as valuable knowledge that can be transferred and you don't have to have a bloody PhD in order to teach someone something, you know? Uh, I learned I learned more from my grandmother who, who attended school until she was nine years old than I learned from anyone else in my whole life. So uh, she didn't need a PhD to teach me about life. So for me, I think learning, language, communication, compassion, these are all linked. Uh, language is how we as human beings communicate with each other. We can either do it in a positive and empowering way, or we can do it in a cruel and destructive way. Learning is about, and knowledge transfer is about the greatest use we can make of language uh, and communicating what we've always done. We communicate through the generations. We communicate through time. So if we want to send a message to the future today, what message are we sending to the next generation of scientists who are down there? that we're going to generate knowledge better. We're going to share that knowledge in a much more equitable way. We're going to develop and deliver learning platforms that everybody can access uh, because we believe that knowledge and certainly scientific knowledge is a global good and one that has to be shared with huge amount of equity. And maybe we can show the people in the vaccines world that we can actually achieve equity at least of learning and knowledge, even if we can't sometimes on some of the more uh, technological thing. So, sorry, I've gone on a little bit, but uh, I just wanted to to reflect on my own thoughts. And uh, your, you and I have had these discussions many times, Guy. And I thank you for your counsel and the team and Heine and everyone else who works on this so hard. Thank you so much, Mike. And what 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 a what a set of thoughts you shared. I just wanted to let you know in the chat. I can't tell you how many people are in the chat. It's hundreds, but uh, let me just give you a flavor. So regarding Open WHO, they've used these words to describe best platform ever, outstanding, wonderful, billion dollar, magical, beautiful, love. So these are some of the things. So this is really the work that you lead. Um, Mike, somebody has said Mike Ryan for next president. I don't know president of where, but obviously what you are saying is really resonating with people. Mm -hmm. Pulling off that, uh, you know, bandage, the wound uh, of injustice. Somebody else has written Gaelic is a beautiful language. Um, so that there are, uh, they've called what you're saying, eye-opening, refreshing. Um, also, just on Open WHO, people have asked, why aren't there courses in Hindi and Swahili? Well, just to let you know, we have courses in Hindi and Swahili. We invite you all to go to the platform click on COVID-19 courses, national languages, and you will see that there. And somebody else asked, can you use this offline? Yes, you can. You have to download the app where there is the internet, but then you download the courses, you can use it offline on the app. There are, Mike, 116 questions. <laughs> uh, some of them are comments. A lot of them are about vaccines. And I, and I already mentioned that we're not going to, this is not a technical vaccine uh, seminar. We're not going to answer that. But I think what I am going to do is I'm going to keep all the questions, all the chat, and we're going to digest this.
and we're going to be posting on the YouTube channel for hashtag uh, learning saves lives and on open WHO. I invite everybody just to uh, go in and I know Mike is uh, Mike has to move to other meetings and when if he's available he'll put on his video otherwise we will continue. So let me go back to the panel and just say from what you've heard what, what, what have you learned since we're in a learning community panelists what have you learned from what you've said what you've heard what others have said what the thoughts that come onto your head so let me go in reverse order let's start with Priyanka first so one quick one quick sentence what have you learned Priyanka wow you know uh, they say that teachers um, the <laughs> teachers learn just as much as the students do from the students as students learn from their teachers every time that you teach your students teach you how to become a better teacher and i think um having going through this process with the with the colleagues in, in at who and and seeing the the translation of these learnings to my students on the on the in the field it's been such an an honor and such a um such a unique privilege to be able to see how how what how we're teaching um how to make that better how mm -hmm. to make it more reachable to to the to the people that that really need it out there and so um we're always learning from the students about translation of the materials not only in terms of language but also in terms of skills in terms of how to make it more accessible to them and understandable through gestures through mm -hmm. um, through through body motions and um, other ways that people learn not only through through words oftentimes you know the the even some some languages don't have don't have scripts um it's only spoken language so we we learn a lot about um how to how to reach those type those types of learners and it's been a really great experience Brianka, thank you that that's really my my uh, reason for teaching is because uh, so the best way I can learn is by helping others learn. And in the chat, somebody has written, you know, we should see teachers as facilitators and students as participants and, and deal with that power uh, imbalance. So the word power segues way to Ellie very well. Ellie, what, what one thing have you learned in this conversation or what's really at the front of your mind? Um, I, it's possibly because it's the most recent, but um, I was noting down... Um, what Mike was saying about scientific knowledge being a global good and how we can all be part of ensuring that that is shared and shared equitably. And obviously in the pandemic, that's, that's such a critical thing where it, all of us have, you know, mm -hmm. social media feeds that are telling us people that we know and love believing in nonsense. Um, <laughs> so being able to be part with this huge community of, of uh, relaying some of the actual scientific knowledge to counter some of the misinformation, um, I think is a, a hugely valuable thing. Thank you. All right, uh, let's keep going. How about uh, Dr. Mona? What, what have you learned from this conversation? Yeah, it was uh, great hearing uh, different ideas and um, thinkings of how learning goes on around the world. And I believe uh, this one is an essential thing uh, that people are learning and the way people are learning, you know, it's corresponding the way we do it also. So it's an encouraging and motivational how uh, learning goes on around the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sheldon, what, what's at the front of your mind or what's in your heart as you listen to this now? You know, I really appreciated the humility of Dr. Ryan's um, words. And in a time when no matter how you feel about either side, words like equality and social justice have been politicized and what's scientific or, or what's not it's, has been politicized. I think that people, all of us can get behind the idea of improving and saving lives and stopping unnecessary suffering. And in order for that to happen, we need to continue to expand the infrastructure uh, necessary um, to share knowledge and um, continue to expand the, the human network with our trained care providers and our community champions uh, to share critical life-saving information. And, uh, I'm just grateful to be a part of the panel today. So thank you. Thank you. A 
again, talking about the power of this human network. And actually, there was a question in the Q&A about the relationship between translators with our borders and us. We, we have a contractual uh, uh, agreement for part of the work, but the value of the work goes well beyond that because outside that contract and the services, we are learning from each other. We are learning a lot from uh, translators with our borders and we are both on different networks to push this uh, uh, field forward. So yes, sometimes, uh, you know, um, we have to pay for some services, but we, uh, Translation is not transactional. This is my message. It's not transactional. It has the power to transform and thereby save lives. Right? So if we cannot communicate, engage with individuals, communities, and families, this is where emergencies are experienced. Emergencies are experienced at the individual household and community level. If we cannot not just tell people, but engage with them, get them to participate in languages they deeply understand and and trust, then we are doing a lot of busy work trying to manage emergencies. So there's a lot, there are services that we have service relationships, but we have a bigger relationship going forward. The same with uh, some of the other companies and some of the other people here. All right, let's go to just a quick, what have you learned from this, uh, from our practitioners? So uh, Gabriel uh, uh, Litovsky from the Paho Virtual Campus, Mike, they're the ones who really helped us expand the Spanish language. Uh, Gabriel, what have you learned listening to uh, all your colleagues here? Uh, thanks, Gaia. Excellent to hear all of the colleagues. Excellent to, to hear Dr. Ryan refer to the idea of the lifelong learning. Uh, I, I congrats especially the, the links with, the, with uh, study and work. This is important, this is fundamental, and it's uh, fundamental to work in the language of the work, to work together and to build together this. Uh, use the problem of the work to learn and to transform the, the health systems. Uh, thank you and uh, congrats for all the experience. Thank you so much. And, and we have a lot to do together, as you say. Uh, let's go to Lea in, uh, in Suriname. Thank you again. Um, again, a very, very good and insightful uh, team uh, panel. I just want to say the one thing that I have learned is that this is the beginning. I believe that in countries like Suriname, where we have taken the leap to have it translated into the mother tongue, this is just the beginning because there are many other languages spoken, you know, dialects, things that really impact the work among those that we need to reach. So it's going to be a start and we're going to look at the different ways of learning. We're going to recognize gender in terms of how we pass on uh, this information because uh, who has time to sit down and you know follow a course for three, four hours when you have children bouncing around and working from home. So I really do think that we need to recognize the nuances of our healthcare providers and seek to meet their, meet their needs, over. Thank you so much. And I know Mike has to go, so it will be really nice if he's able to uh, say goodbye to you all. Mike? Great. No, it's fascinating to continue to listen. I'm sorry, I do have to, have to go. Uh, j just one thing for us all to remember, because we, you know, we're all thinking in billions and populations, and we're thinking you know, these big numbers, how many cases and deaths, and how many vaccines, and how many trillions of dollars. Uh, the ends get bigger and bigger. I always try to remind myself that N equals one. One person matters. And teachers and trainers know that. Doctors and nurses know that. It's that individual patient that you give life to. It's that individual student or participant that you transfer knowledge to and the satisfaction that comes with that. Uh, the ones add up then to the millions. But we have to remember that at the core of each number are people, individuals who have needs, desires, dreams, aspirations, and a vision for their own future. And I think in that, uh, this is fantastic to see this energy in this room uh, and to see that N equals one. One person matters. Uh, one life matters. And one journey through life matters. And life is a journey of learning. So let us all try and support each other in that. So thanks, Guy. It was fascinating. It was inspiring for me. Best thing of my day. Uh, you've made my weekend uh, because it's just lovely to feel the energy uh, and the vibes from everyone on this uh, on this call.
Thank you. Mike, thank you. There are people thank who are you, Dr. Ryan. And also uh, there is uh, somebody from Butembo who, who you worked with in Ebola. The people are on and they're saying wonderful things about you. I will make a list of it and tell you. And I will tell you in my own mother tongue next time I see you. Okay, let's see how that goes. Well, thank that's, you, gonna, so that's gonna make a change, Gaia, because you're usually telling me all the things I need to get my act together on, which I really appreciate too. So it'd be nice to be coming along with compliments. Thank you, Gaia. Thanks for your leadership. Bye-bye. Thank, you so Thank you. And we will continue here, Mike. Good luck with your day and, and the response. Uh, so let, let's keep moving. Uh, uh, Leah, you just finished. So let me uh, get back to where is... Uh, uh, Dr. Safarov, uh, followed by Vitali. Dr. Safarov uh, from Tajikistan, go ahead. <laughs> what did yeah. you learn, sir? Yeah, thank you very much, Gayan. It was really nice to talk and to learn from my uh, other colleagues how they intervened uh, through the using the uh, open WHO among of their uh, very good or uh, uh, fragile system existing in their country. I just... Uh, uh, Learned that this amazing uh, digital approach uh, intervened in the health system of the, my country. And uh, all levels in the hospital level and the primary healthcare level and the laboratory really uh, like uh, the approach. And it really gives in the short uh, term, in the short time, to learn from the very, uh, I already mentioned that uh, very simplified uh, uh, platform and materials and to transfer this knowledge to others. This is amazing. And uh, my colleague already said, this is just a beginning. It's our baby and we have to feed and also to mm -hmm. treat and also to take care. And we will in, uh, indeed to implement and to uh, have a, a future healthy and also to protect everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Dr. Vitali Stetskis, uh, what have you learned? Thank you very much, Gaia. Yeah, it's been incredibly interactive and very useful discussion. And I'm really grateful for colleagues of sharing uh, those, those thoughts. And also it's been a really uh, interesting learning opportunity uh, to get feedback from the, from the participants. And uh, it is really important, and and uh, and this life um, lifelong learning experience is something which is uh, which is really an interesting concept, which uh, which actually is being operationalized, as I see in, in many countries throughout the world, and with uh, with, uh, with our dear panelists and uh, who were reflecting on the different different approaches. Uh, so the, the other thing which is really interesting is that uh, it's good to embrace the multidimensional approach and to, 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 to do several, um, several, uh, several um, outreach uh, ways uh, in, in bringing the knowledge and, and reaching those who, who require knowledge in this challenging environment when there is no time and the people need to respond, there is a response fatigue, so that's really interesting interesting experience as well as uh, how important it is to engage with community and through the community to make sure that uh, that there is demand for community to learn as well as for healthcare practitioners and for the responders to, to learn and that's that's also an interesting and open WHO also a great opportunity for community to learn because there are materials for uh, for lay people to get uh, to get basic understanding and then very uh, important understanding of how to protect oneself, how to make sure that, that there are public health measures in place. And, uh, and uh, another, uh, my last uh, closing remark is that uh, it is really important and, and that's one, uh, once again, re-emphasizing what that we are doing uh, and moving into the right direction is that it is important to increase the equity through translating and through bringing, uh, bringing uh, the, the material in the in the language which is very much familiar to participants, despite like in Kazakhstan we have a privilege of, of having mostly bilingual population who understand Kazakh and, and, and mm -hmm. Russian language. However, and Russian is one of the official UN languages. However, we we learn more and more while interacting in healthcare facilities that that 
uh, the, there is more and more need to, to, to get uh, material in, 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 in Kazakh, and that's why we are working on this. So people get, get quicker understanding of the basic concepts. So Thank that's you, uh, over from my side. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Haiti, you get to say what you've learned too. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm really amazed and, and encouraged and empowered by all these stories, both from the panel here, but also on the chat. Really amazing testimonies of, of uh, like-minded people, people who understand the value of learning. And, and, and it's the power of working together. This digitized era can bring us together in a way that, that we are together now. So I think there we have really great challenge ahead of us, but in a way also tools and means to, to convey the, the, the learning knowledge down to those areas where all, all areas where, it, where it's needed. And, and I think that's the invitation for all of us to be the multiplier, to, to be the change agent, to, to work, um, to, 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 to make that difference and, and bring more uh, people in this journey, whether it was Open WHO or, or any other the form of, of learning. So really, really amazed of all the testimonies here. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I wanted to also say, you know, one, one thing we're, we're going to, we want to, you to do one more thing, but before that, I want us to remember that, as I said before, health emergencies, any emergencies experienced at the individual level, the family level, community level. Language is one of the many, but important tools that can help people, individuals, families, communities understand what's going on, contribute to the response, shape the response to suit them, right? And then of course, many of you talked about health workers, how they can participate in the response safely, effectively. So there are many barriers to learning, but language is what we have focused on today. Going forward, we're gonna focus on other topics. Um, we are going to take all the questions and all the comments, and I'm going to share that, share a summary of that with everybody here. And we're gonna post some thoughts related to that uh, to, uh, on Open WHO and also on our YouTube channel. I invite you all, many of the questions are about, do we have this language, this course? Yes, we have a lot. And if it's not in your language, reach out. Let's figure out a way to get it into your language. This is very much organic. We are growing and it is a social uh, networked uh, objective that we are pursuing to save lives, to protect people, to protect the vulnerable. Our next, uh, next one is on gender and learning in emergencies. And it will coincide with International Day of Women on 8th March. But before we go to that, we, I really have to hear from you. So we're gonna have one evaluation question, which I am inviting you to answer. It's a multiple choice. And on the chat, if you have any feedback for me and the team and anybody, please feel free to write it. Be honest, please be honest. Here is your question. How would you rate the webinar? Inspiring? Excellent, good, or poor, a waste of your time. So be honest, we're not afraid of feedback. Somebody told me feedback is the breakfast of champions. You can only learn and grow if you get honest feedback. Um, so please go ahead. About a third of you have voted. Anybody who wants to write in the chat, any, any, any feedback to us, you've already given us some amazing feedback. Thank you so much. For those of us working at the global level, we know we're trying to reach you in countries and communities, but this is a rare occasion where we can just hear from a few of you from your comments and your chat, how it's being received. We're about 54, if a few more people vote, please. Thank you so much. Feedback is really important. The same when you receive our products, when you see translated versions, you want to improve it, speak up. We, we use speed and, you know, we do not let perfection be the enemy of good, but it's only from you and those of you who use it and use it to teach who can improve it more and more. Okay, we, we will just take five, four, three, two, one, and stop the poll. We can see, yep, so 
uh, very, very, very useful feedback. So at least minimally you found some part interesting. Uh, the majority of you found it excellent or inspiring. And I must say, if I could give you feedback, I found it excellent and inspiring that we could get together several hundred of us to really talk about, as I said, something we're passionate about. Social justice is not an abstract con concept. We can apply it in our work. And in health emergencies, this is how we are together with you trying to apply it. Language, mother tongue, the closest we can get to cultural contextualization, the closer we are to helping people really understand deeply what they need to understand, but also to tell us what they need to tell us. It's not just about one way communication. So thank you so much. I'm so grateful to the practitioners, the panelists, the participants. Uh, I'm very sorry we went six minutes over time, but there seems to be so much uh, that we want to say. Uh, we'll let you go. Have a great end of the day, end of the week. In about a month's time, we're going to continue. We're going to continue these webinars. Very soon, we're going to have the technology to have uh, um, interpretation of our webinars, so it won't just be in English, but I certainly didn't want to delay uh, this process, hashtags learning saves lives until we had the technology. I find when you set a goal and you start, the tool will come to you and we commit to having that tool. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful end of the week and stay safe and uh, look after yourself and your loved ones and see you at the next webinar. 8th of March, we're looking at the challenges women face learning in emergencies and men are absolutely invited this is not a, a male exclusion we want men and women to, to make sure that we help uh, we make sure gender is not a barrier to learning thank you all bye bye thank you